Hey everyone, and welcome to a milestone moment for The Real Stuff. This is our first audience episode. If you listened to my first solo episode where I introduced the show and the format, I talked a little bit about what my vision was for these episodes with audience members. You might remember that my initial vision was that each of these audience episodes was going to have three separate people calling in on the same episode all talking about the same topic. I wanted to get three different people who had different takes on one topic so that I can pull them all together and craft this really well-rounded, interesting story that shares lots of diverse feelings and perspectives when it comes to one issue. I wanted to let you know that is what you're going to see today. So that's what this first audience episode is. But just a heads up for the future, after we did this recording or all three of these recordings, We decided to change the format for these audience episodes for the most part and to have each audience caller just be a standalone episode on its own. After I had each of these conversations, I realized that I had incredibly long, sometimes over an hour conversation with each of these three callers you're going to hear from. And each conversation was so good that it wound up being really difficult for me to cull the conversations down to like 20 minutes each so that what you were getting in this episode doesn't go too much beyond one hour. And on top of that, as we started trying to pull together three audience guests for future audience episodes, it was proving really difficult to find these people that had similar things to talk about but had really diverse and different experiences. As the host and the producer of this show, I was realizing how difficult it was to find three people that tell a very well-rounded and all-encompassing story. There's kind of no way to do that. And so even in this episode, even though I was trying to find people that had different experiences and different outcomes, there are still some things you need to keep in mind. For example, everyone in this episode comes from a heterosexual relationship or a heterosexual marriage. Two of the stories in this episode are actually similar to each other in that they both led to the relationship ending. But in order to give you a little bit of a different spin on it, One of the conversations is from the perspective of the person who led to the relationship ending, and the other is from the perspective of the person who was more passive in the experience. And then the third conversation I have is with a couple that despite having had many hardships going into the experience of having a baby, they actually came out stronger. I tried, because I'm trying here to give you a podcast that tells a story and takes you on a journey, I sandwiched that positive story in between the two stories that led to the marriage's ending just to sort of, I don't know, spread things out. But really at the end of the day, my goal with this episode is not to make any sort of statement or take any sort of stance on what having a baby does to a relationship. This is more meant to just be an amalgamation of three interesting stories that I hope you'll listen to. I hope you'll enjoy hearing. I hope maybe you'll feel connected to these people in some way. And overall, it's just about listening to someone else's life and perspective. I am likely going to do a whole solo episode at some point in the future, maybe even an episode with Michael, so not a solo, on my experience of how having a baby changed our relationship. Because Michael and I were together for over 10 years before we had a baby. And I can say with certainty, a baby changes things. It was not always easy transitioning into parenthood. It was not sunshine and rainbows all the time. Michael and I had a lot of ups and a lot of downs. And I always say, you know, we entered into parenthood with this rock solid 10 plus year relationship that I felt like was absolutely unbreakable. And I have to say, we had many moments in our entrance to parenthood that we together in a calm way looked at each other and said, wow, we understand now how having children can drive couples apart. Not that we felt we were in that place personally, but we felt all the tension and all the stress and all the things that having children make you feel. For us, the biggest key was keeping clear lines of communication not letting feelings and emotions bottle up. We were always very vocal with each other. We would argue about things if we had something to argue about, but our arguments are always very respectful. We're not yelling at each other. We listen to each other. Michael is particularly a really good listener. I'm getting better at listening and closing my mouth and letting him say what he has to say and how he feels and acknowledging how he feels before I start defending myself. So listen, there's a lot to talk about here, and I do promise to do a full episode on this on our own. Our first guest today is a man 
This man wanted to be anonymous. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you're going to notice his face is blurred. He chose to change his name. You'll hear us at the start of the episode talking about what name he wants to go by in this conversation. And, you know, I think from your perspective, the audience member, you're going to hear this conversation differently based on your unique life experiences. You may have more or less empathy for him based on things that have happened to you or people you know. But I do think that these conversations are worth having, even if they're hard to have and even if they're hard to listen to. So let's get into our first caller. Chet, Chad, what are we calling you? <laughs> Chet, let's let's go with Chad. Chad uh, or Chet? No, the, Chet works. <laughs> Chet, okay, we're going with Chet. Chet. First of all, for my audience, Chet has written in to come on to tell his story up front. I would really like to thank you, Chet, for coming on because first and foremost, it's very different for me to hear from a male. I have a 90% female focused audience. And so it's always interesting to find out that men are following me and engaging in my content. And specifically to hear a story like the one you're about to tell, it's incredibly rare to have the chance to hear from a person that has been through this experience. So I'm very happy that you are opening up on the show and I'd like to give you the floor to introduce yourself and share what happened. Well, Lucy, thank you for, for having me and appreciate just what you're doing with the show and, and bringing to light a lot of these conversations that need to be had, the transparency behind it and, and the reason why I want to do this and, and be transparent about this is because I know that out there somewhere there is another person and other people who are going through something very similar. And I want them to know that they are not alone in that space and that the highs of what they're experiencing are incredibly high, but the lows are also incredibly low. So my story is one that stems from generational trauma, if you will. I was in a, you know, seemingly very happy marriage. We were the first of our friends to get married, um, fairly successful careers, and first of our friends to have kids. That's when the challenges started to kick in. And I, after two and a half, three years, made a choice to step outside of my marriage. And I got involved with a coworker that I was traveling with and that affair continued for about six to seven months where it was secret. And the weight of that kept piling on and eventually came clean and told my wife what was going on. That was one of the most explosive nights that I can remember in the sense that my entire world and everything that I knew just kind of completely exploded and the reality of things set in. And we, at the time, daughter was three and a half, or just turned four. Um, and we tried to work it out. We tried to navigate. And the truth was, I, I just, I wasn't in it. And the affair and relationship continued. Um, at the same time, my wife and I got pregnant. And ended up having a second child and under no circumstances were we going to give up that child. It took us some time to navigate through all that and pandemic hit. We were going to be separating and moving out and all that and the pandemic hit and it forced us to learn to co-parent together. Uh, I think that our relationship is actually much stronger now that we've come out the other side of this and we are better co-parents because of it. So take me back to those early years of your marriage after you have a baby. And I think as you were alluding to pretty much right away, the addition of a child to the family stirred up some dust. What exactly was happening? How did that feel from your end? It's interesting. I mean, having children bring up a lot of, a lot of different things. And 
you know, I think people say, oh, well, I have a, we have a pet together and how much more different can it be? It's a lot different. <laughs> we, uh, I think each of us, we realize that we have very different parenting techniques um, and in ways, and that stems from our respective families of how we were raised and kind of both the good and the bad come out and it becomes really difficult to navigate. We found it really difficult to ever truly align and get on the same page and be patient enough with one another to work through the challenge as a team. And yes, we were in survival mode, but just something wasn't clicking. And my wife had very bad postpartum, which was a huge component of it and wasn't able to course correct. And I didn't understand. It's like you work in a profession where you should, un you help people, you should know how to do this. What was her profession? She's a, a licensed marriage and family therapist. I, I did not understand that at the same time was balance, trying to balance a job that was 60 to 70 hours a week. Um, it was a lower paying job than I'd worked previously. And we had a, we had a mortgage. It was trying to survive. As a result, there was just a lot of extra pressure that fell onto me and trying to wanting to be involved in those milestones and, and being present for things. It was really difficult when, when you are working that much. Did you guys plan to have a child or was it a surprise? No, the, the first child was very much planned. Before trying to conceive and before going through the stages of, you know, I've been through it with my partner of we had multiple discussions ahead of having a child about what that might look like. Obviously, there's no way mm -hmm. to know how everything's going to shake out. But we had many discussions about the division of labor in a relationship and how we wanted to be together as a team, what tasks one of us wanted to take on versus the other. Had you had discussions with your wife about this or did you just sort of agree we want a kid and we'll figure it out when it comes? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, the irony of my profession is my personal life is, is very much a kind of wing it and go with the flow of it. And uh, we had certainly discussed it and expressed interest in wanting to have a child. And I don't think we really, we didn't have the right conversations and we didn't have as many of the conversations as we should have. And that definitely impacted things. You have your daughter. Your wife is going through what sounds like postpartum depression or anxiety or both. And you seem to have the weight of the world on your shoulders with finances and your job and now parenting and trying to, I guess, correct me if this isn't the right word, but navigate your wife's emotions while you maybe simultaneously felt like she shouldn't be having those emotions, but trying to understand how she is having them and how to help her through them. I'm trying to connect the line of I'm having struggles at home and now I'm in bed with someone else. What does that timeline look like and how long does that take? So I think it was by two and a half, I was working at a new in a new line of work. And at that point, I think we, my wife and I still hadn't been on a date after having a child. And a lot of people say, it's like, Hey, one of the most important things is to continue to date, to date your partner, find time for each other, put yourselves first so that you can continue to have those conversations and make sure the relationship is solid. And we, we hadn't done that. And I was growing tired of, of trying to set that up. We, you know, uh, getting a babysitter was out of the question bringing in grandparents to babysit was kind of not in the equation and it was really challenging. And as a result of that, our, our sex life and connection was just completely off. Did you feel like that was something you were trying to do month after month, week after week that she was rejecting or it just never happened? The dates? I think it was a combination of both. I think there for a while I was trying, like, hey, let's go out, let's go do something. And, and it just wasn't landing. And it felt like there was always an excuse as to why we couldn't have a babysitter come and do this. Like, let's 
prioritize those things so that we can prioritize getting our relationship back in order. And it didn't happen. And I was upset. I felt lonely. I, I felt like I, I wanted some attention. And I found that in someone else at work. And one thing led to another. And next thing I knew, we were, we were in bed together. And this was after several months of us becoming better and better friends and um, just getting to know one another and just like, oh, I really click with this person. I know my wife and I are just very different sexually and I was looking for something different. I wanted our sex life to be a little bit spicier and, and to have different elements in it. And we couldn't have a conversation about that. Like it just wasn't, we weren't allowed to talk about it. <laughs> You know, I think for a lot of partners, the experience of watching their partner with a baby, it can kind of go one of two ways. On the one hand, there's, oh my gosh, look at the love this person is pouring into this child. It's making me love them even more and making me feel so connected to them. But then when a relationship has soured in some way, I can empathize with the feeling of watching that love pour out and having it feel like a dagger to your own heart. That's a great way to break it down. Um, the feeling that comes to mind for me is jealousy and jealousy for two reasons. I was jealous that our, our newborn was getting this attention, this, this incredible amount of love that she was pouring into her. And I, I wanted that. I wanted that in our relationship. But at the same time, I was also jealous that she got to spend all the time with our child. And I wanted to be there. I wanted to have those one-on-one -on -one connection opportunities. And I think because of what she was going through, she wasn't able to detach from our baby to fully trust me to be with the baby alone. And I wanted that. I wanted that one-on-one -on -one connection with our child. And I, I didn't feel like I was getting that. I think having been a mother myself, I can say with certainty that the feeling of wanting to be sexual with your partner or wanting to really do anything romantic with a partner, especially going from caretaker mode to that, there is this in-between gap that you need to bridge. In my case, in order to get to those moments when I felt like I could be with my husband as his wife, I felt like the gap that I needed was moments by myself caring for myself and it sounds like your wife wasn't able to give herself that free time i mean it sounds like she even had difficulty separating to have a babysitter come and was pouring herself wholly into your child so i can understand how she maybe wasn't feeling sexy in those times i do want our conversation to primarily focus on your relationship post baby. And I think we can't disentangle it from what you just said about the spice that you were looking for to whatever level you're comfortable. Can you share what you were looking for, what your wife was not giving you? Yeah. I mean, I think the best way to describe it, uh, our, our sex life was, was very vanilla. It was very missionary position. This is it. We're done. And let's move on and we don't talk about it. it we, there was no conversation about fantasies. There was no conversation about like, hey, what do you like? This is what I like. Let's try this. There was no exploration beyond this little box of like, cool, missionary sex, procreate, done. And what about in your dating life with her before babies? Um, in the dating life prior, she was the uh most sexually wild person that I'd ever been with. So she changed. She changed. And I think that change which we've since discussed was a lot of that with her needing a an intellectual and an emotional connection first before she can have that physical component. Did you feel like this affair with this coworker was you falling in love with someone or was it purely attention seeking and garnering? That's a great question. Um, I think initially it was seeking attention and, and, and having that and being able to be with someone that I felt like was as sex positive as me, as sexually curious as me. And do you mind if I ask what types of things you explored outside of maybe 
new positions? <laughs> sure. Um, I mean, lingerie was a big thing. Toys were a, a really big thing. Um, just dirty talk, the way in which we were communicating with one another, being able to really share these fantasies and feel safe and feel like it's okay to be like, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of you in this position, or I'd like to see you with another person and me in this space and being able to talk freely about that without feeling like you're being scrutinized or judged or made to feel less than. And that's, I, I felt inhibited when I was in my marriage and it was just like, Oh, well this, I feel like I've got this, ball of energy and I'm trapped in this little like glass bottle and you just want to break out. Hey guys, Lucy here. As I mentioned up front at the intro to this episode, it was really difficult to trim down these interviews from the hour-long conversations I had with these people to the place that they're at now. And as I'm listening back to this conversation in particular, there's something that I kind of feel like isn't coming across wholly that I want to call out. In my call with this person, it was clear to me how he still feels a tremendous amount of love and appreciation for his ex. He acknowledged on our call that she's an amazing mom, and in hindsight, he clearly can recognize the love that she poured into their children and how that's positively affected them. He also did poignantly acknowledge his desire for her happiness, even if her happiness means that she's happy with someone else. We talked extensively about the remorse that he feels and how complex that is. He feels a deep, deep sense of regret over his past mistakes, and that came across very clear to me. And he also feels a real desire to go back and do things differently. I know he would change things if he could. And I just felt like I needed to add this in here because as you're listening to these conversations, which are trimmed down slices of these full complex calls that I've been having with these people, I just want to make sure that if nothing else, you go into the listening experience with a bit more of an open mind and a softer heart towards these people. I know from listening to podcasts where real people come on as the guests that often it takes me hearing from them for longer and longer periods of time before I really can empathize with them. In each of these interviews, you're only getting 20 to 25 minutes of these people. So try to strap on your empathy helmets as you're listening to this and recognize that the words you're hearing are just a portion of the full conversation we had. Okay, let's get back into it. I'm curious if your desire to explore sexually and try these different modalities, number of people in the room, just all of it was more of an internal craving and desire to have some sort of control. I'm trying to mirror it to what you weren't getting in your relationship. That's a hundred percent part of it. And I, and I can't pretend like it's not, it's something I discussed with my therapist of my trigger points or when I feel like I don't have control over a situation is, is really difficult for me. My line of work requires me to be in control and to have very tight control over how things are operating. And I think what's, what's interesting is kind of as the flip of what you just said, I think there were moments of what I was finding in this affair of, of being able to let go of control and have someone else be dominant in this regard and let me just kind of like cool i'm along for the ride on this i don't have to worry about planning this or doing this someone else is coming to the table and there's a better balance of like all right here's an idea here's an idea here's an idea and you kind of build things together i know you mentioned that there was generational trauma can you mm -hmm. explain a little bit what you mean about that sure um i knew I'd known from a young age that my mom's dad was having an affair and I knew, and I saw how much pain that caused the family. My dad, I didn't know. I suspected that my dad had as well. And that was a really tough thing to reconcile with my, the relationship with my mom growing up with, was very tumultuous. And in my relationship with my dad, it's like he was my idol and you don't want to see this person that you look up to as less than or, or breaking a, a marital vow that really kind of flips your world upside down. When I eventually came clean to my family and, and told them about the affair that I was having, 
a truth came out that blew my fucking mind. And that was my mom had had an affair first. And I was like, what? And I think that goes into raise a much larger question and, and kind of perspective on life and relationships and monogamy. And my entire world was just like, wait a minute, what, why are we trying to fit into this box of life when it doesn't necessarily feel right for all of us? That had to have been, as you said, just a bomb that went off and that shook the foundation of everything you thought you knew. And I'm curious if when you say generational trauma, do you feel like you sort of at that point knew somewhere deep down that you were going to repeat this cycle and that you you always felt like a ticking time bomb? Like, when is it going to happen? Because this has happened with everyone that's come before me. A hundred percent. I knew I felt inside of me that I, I, I could not stay faithful in the relationship. Did you tell that to your wife? I didn't. And that was a really, really, really hard truth for me to to sit with and come to terms with. When was that? Like, how, how long into your marriage or parenthood did you realize that? I think I had an inkling of it pre-kids. And I tried to silence that voice for a long time of like, no, you're, you're this, you're loyal. You need to stay the course. I felt like I had to understand this. I, I had to know, I had to do what my parents did so I would understand how it disrupted the family, how it caused stress, how it impacts the kids. And it, it's just, it's a weird psychological thing that I wish that I could go back on. You know, it's very easy for almost anyone listening, especially someone who has been cheated on or has a close friend or family member who's been cheated on to just be listening to you with disgust and to be saying, fuck that. It's horrible. No matter what the situation you screwed up questioning how you think this is going to affect your children. And if you think that you can do anything to stop the cycle from happening with them and their futures. However, then there, the other side of it is viewing you as a human who very clearly did not want to be in a monogamous marriage. I, I think everyone would agree that probably the best scenario, the best case scenario would have been you realizing you didn't want to be in the marriage, you communicating that with your wife and getting out of the marriage before or after kids, but getting out in a way that didn't do something devastating to her to betray her trust. Yeah. It's not that I didn't want to be and don't want to be in a monogamous marriage. It's the fact that I wasn't ready to be in a monogamous marriage. And I'd only been with a couple people and I was curious and I wanted to have a better understanding of what was out there and, and not feel forced into this path that I just wasn't ready for. Part of me being open about my story is as I've accepted what I've done and, and kind of put the shame of it aside and been more open with my friends, I found that actually two women I know that went to high school with are both in the midst of affairs and they've come to me and they've talked to me about the experiences and how they're, how to navigate certain things. And it's shocking, but I've said to them, I was like, look, the highs of these experiences are incredibly high, but the lows are incredibly low. For me, it was two very serious and very close moments of suicide. And you have to be prepared to, lose your family and your world as you know it to blow it up and coming back to the now of what I focus on it's how do I show up for my kids in the best way that I can how do I be the best parent I can be how do I try to do better we make it a habit and a priority to really show the kids that yes parent mom and dad are separated and divorced but we are still a unit and we're still a family and we still love each other I have two final questions for you First question is, to date, outwardly or in any way that you could tell, has your wife forgiven you? I don't think she will ever truly forgive me. I And I don't blame her. Um, 
I think we've worked through a lot, but I know that there are things that are still very triggering for her. And if anything, we've just gotten better about understanding how we communicate with one another. We have a good system of communication now. Then my final question is, have you forgiven yourself? No. So you're still angry at yourself? Yeah. I think there's the hardest thing is the little moments of seeing your kids grow up and knowing that something happened and you weren't there for it, that you weren't in the house. Seeing them try to navigate what it's like being a young girl and, and not having a dad who's present. I shouldn't say I'm not present. I'm present in their lives. But I think it just challenges you, challenges you to do better. Well, Chet. <laughs> I forgot that's my name. <laughs> Thank you so much for yeah. being willing to come on here, for sitting here spilling your emotions. I don't necessarily know of all the people in my life who have had an affair or been on the receiving end of it. But what I can say is this being the first conversation I've ever had with a person who has gone through it and been the instigator of it, I have to believe that there's some there's something positive to be said about the way you speak about it, the fact that you are in therapy, the fact that you have been able to create such a loving environment for your kids, even if you're not there 24-7 living in the house married to their mom. And listen, this is life. I mean, life isn't perfect and people make mistakes and some mistakes are bigger than others. But I personally believe that it's more so about the repair after a mistake has been made. It doesn't negate the mistake, but this point forward, it's all about how you can repair and hopefully mend the relationship as best as possible or the friendship with your wife as best as possible and be there for your kids. I'm sure you are, but I would even say being honest with your kids about what happened and talking about it maybe a little bit more than you were spoken to about it as a child because maybe the hidden nature of what happened and the explosive way you found out was something that set you off when maybe you would have been able to process it if you had started seeing a therapist at a younger age and it was all just out in the open in your family. Yeah, I, I think that's that's pretty spot on, Lucy, and that's something that we have tried really hard to, to be open and honest with the kids. And, you know, our oldest is, is almost 10 and the questions that she has and being able to help answer those and, and be very transparent. And I've said to her many times, like, look, if you have questions about the situation, you know, I'm always, you can always ask me. I'm always happy to listen. You know, if you, I understand if you're angry with me, but I, I want it to be something that she feels comfortable with being into it, being able to engage if she wants. Well, seriously, thank you. We really appreciate you coming on and I hope you keep listening and learning from the show. Likewise. Thank you, Lucy. This chat was very interesting because I personally have never had a person in my real life come to me and open up about having cheated on their partner in a marriage. I was really torn during that call thinking to myself actively, what is my role in this interview? What is my role in all of these interviews? In this case, am I supposed to be angry with him? Am I supposed to be making him feel bad for what he's done? Am I supposed to step in and be the voice of every person out there, maybe every woman who's ever been cheated on? And am I supposed to like be the person who finally has the platform and can tell him off and to tell him fuck you? I thought about it and I realized that my role on this show, particularly with guests who volunteer to come on here, and to open up and tell hard stories. My role is not to judge people, even people who have done bad things. I mean, maybe even especially people 
who have done things that they regret. I think my role is rather to listen empathetically to their story and to recognize that we are all humans going through life and making mistakes along the way. I think especially on this show, which is all about encouraging people to come on and be authentic and be real and share their secrets and their stories, the last thing I'm supposed to do as the host is to make people feel bad for coming on and sharing that. And I always want to make sure my guests feel comfortable and feel listened to, even if what they're saying doesn't paint them in the best light. So I'm curious to know if Chet's side of the story made you feel any sort of way towards him. I'm curious if you felt any empathy towards him, seeing as people who cheat on significant others don't often get any empathy from society. So it is a very interesting topic. And thank you again to Chet for coming on and giving us that conversation on this show. Okay, moving on to our second guest. This is actually a couple who wrote in to come onto the show together. And they were open to coming on with their real names, their real faces. So if you watch this on YouTube, you will see them. And the story you're about to hear is filled with a lot of grief, a lot of ups and downs. But these two truly are a beautiful couple. They're beautiful people inside and out. I highly recommend you watch this one on YouTube to see some of their body language, specifically when Zach starts crying at the end. So without further ado, here is Maria and Zach. I read your submission, and especially in the context of this episode, I was enamored by your letter because (laughs) I felt like my takeaway from your letter was that pretty much against all odds and in the face of many of life's most difficult moments, you two persevered and actually got stronger Mm -hmm. from those hardships. So I'm really excited to hear, you know, from your perspective, what happened. And I don't know if one of you wants to take the mic first, but, you know, whoever whoever wants to start, maybe you can take me back to pre-baby because I know you experienced a lot of sadness and grief before you got pregnant. Yeah, so this is like just as the pandemic is starting. Um, So it's March 2020. And prior to this, we got married in 2019. And then March 2020, my mom got sick. We were in the hospital with her and we weren't sure what was going to happen. It was um, she had type 1 diabetes. um, So she had lived like a really good life. But then kind of at the same time, her heart and her kidneys decided like, hmm, we're not doing so hot. But at that time, she comes around and she's okay. So we just continue on with life. We're just working, living life. My mom is sort of like experiencing a new normal. We buy a house. Then in March 2021, it kind of, my mom just gets an infection from her port where she was doing dialysis and she just doesn't recover from that. Now we're navigating still a pandemic and not knowing what's going to happen with my mom and not being able to be there with her and all of the restrictions. So she dies in March. Oh, I'm so sorry. Hmm. Thanks. Um, and also my... I mean, even just that experience was like extra traumatic. They like called us and we're like, I think you guys should come here. Like it's not, she's not doing well today and and like as we're arriving at the hospital like she died and we just like missed it we just we had to wait in line to be screened. yeah we're like waiting in line to like be like you know yeah. screened for covid and yeah that's like when she died and we didn't we didn't get to like be there and yeah say goodbye and wow like barely got to see her at all during that it was even just that sort of small piece of the experience was just like crap yeah yeah wow that's That is awful. And, you know, all the while you two are newlyweds Mm -hmm. and that first year of marriage is supposed to be just the most joyous. And you said you bought a house. Yeah. And so that must have been really hard. How long had you two been dating before you got married? Uh, We were only dating, yeah, for two years before we got married. We met when we were in our early 20s. Yeah, it's true. But we never dated until we landed in the same town. And then our friends kind of pushed us together and it worked out. So you date for two years, you get married. We get married. Your mom passes a year later. Yeah. And now, where are we? We had already talked about trying for a kid. 
And so we were, we had been trying. um, And that was kind of just also like such a kick in the teeth because my mom was like desperate for a grandkid. Like this was just like, she could not wait. Mm -hmm. And so it just felt really sad that we were so close. And like, little did we know that like, she would die and then a month later we just that was the month we got pregnant um after trying for i think we tried for eight months so it was just kind of like oh man uh so we got pregnant and we go oh my gosh okay here we go and we just sort of navigate like i'm still grieving i'm still in shock yeah and then you start to just have some struggle yeah i mean my journey with like substance use is is like long and and has been around in my life for a long time but wasn't very prevalent for a long time and then through like even just like starting with the pandemic i think right like that's a pretty common theme and it's true and but then like yeah this like loss and grief and pregnancy and change kind of hits our life head on and and for sure just like amplifies that for me and and start to like yeah lean into to drinking more and to like you know you don't kind of notice it and and lots of your friends are doing it but i mean um kind of just kept white knuckling my way through that and and being like you know i'm i'm good like it's fine and stop for a couple weeks and take a break and and just like kind of did that dance for a little while when you say that there's history there is that with one of your parents yeah i mean family history but even just historically for me like uh like even like growing up you know when i was younger but for sure i think like the the baby and the amount of change that that was about to bring into my life um was it was a was a big player and that was like a big piece in that yeah the fear of the unknown i think like we're of our like friend circle kind of later in the game in terms of baby baby making baby having uh we've seen lots lots of our friends friends have like a lot of our friends have like six and seven and eight year olds now right so we've seen them all do it and and i'm just like oh gosh like this is going to be a huge change and i like to do all these things and i'm not gonna be able to do any of them anymore and then you like tell yourself this story and i think that was a big uh big part of it for sure seeing as you felt numb during your pregnancy and this is when zach felt under a lot of stress what was your relationship like during your pregnancy both in terms of physically and sexually but also just emotionally were you connected yeah i mean oh man it's but it's wild to look back eh like yeah i think we had lots of moments of like intimacy and closeness like a lot of moments of just like wow like we're doing it and feeling excited and feeling close like i we definitely had moments of me expressing like hey i'm kind of worried about like how much you're drinking or like how you're handling your stress but it wasn't derailing us to a point where we were just like angry all the time or fighting all the time it would be like phases if you were fighting like is that what you would be fighting about were you trying to get him to stop yeah, yeah yeah or like i would just be like Listen, bud, I'm sad too. And not that I feel this way, so I don't want this to come off as my judgment, but was there a part of you, Maria, that was like, Zach, it was my mom. Yeah. You know what? That sounds familiar, actually. Does it? (laughs) Okay, that's funny, because I was going to say, like, I never thought to myself, like, it's my mom, because I think, too, like, I lamented for you that you didn't that you're not going to get to have her because she was so awesome. But there was a little, like, there was some resentment there where I was just like, I have to just take care of myself. Like, don't you think I want to, like, not take care of myself? But I have to because I'm growing a kid. So it must be nice for you that you can go choose whatever you want. So after baby's born, what's going on with your relationship? Well, you're in this little bubble. But, like, of course, you're not sleeping. The grief is still there. We're both only children, so, like, our family wants to come, and they're just, like, it's just a lot. It's the first grandchild. Yeah. I think in those, like, first little time, like, right after um, our son was born, I I would say that I had kind of spiraled and kind of just, like, landed in this belief that, like, I was fine, and I would figure it out, and I was fine, and I would take a break and do this and do that and try these, like, moderation techniques and this and that. I took some time off work just to, like, be 
be at, be away from work in the summer, like it's just some parental leave kind of time that I was able to take. Mm-hmm. Um, but like for me, it was just like, woo, I'm on vacation and like I'm um, just going to drink my way through this like little bit of time off instead of spending, you know, quality time or while spending quality time with my, my like new child and my family. Yeah, to the point where like, you know, it's starting to become evident to people around me that that care about me that like things aren't in control you know we kind of go back to work we get into the fall and then i would say that's kind of when things really really started changing like i yeah it was starting to like affect life like i disappeared for a couple of nights here or there where i just like shut off my phone and uh, didn't really want anything to do with anyone um and didn't want to be found and was just like making really awful choices what's happening with with you maria and your baby when when he's not there like what is walk me through what's going through your head that night i'm just thinking like i have to get through this night take care of leo and whatever's gonna happen will happen i mean like throughout all of this the thing i think that like is important to to know is that like i believe in Zach so much so it's it was like this really hard thing is happening to us and there are like moments where I'm furious and angry and like in those nights sometimes when he wasn't around the rage of calling his phone and not getting an answer like that was rage like that was really hard but I never stopped knowing that like that wasn't who he was that was a thread that kept us going so like it did kind of feel like it was a thing that was up and down and that we were always working on as a team together yeah then as you say it kind of just went south but I just had Leo like I just had to be a mom so I couldn't spiral because I had Leo when you ultimately Zach went into a program was that your own doing or was that the two of you together or was it more Maria's idea? No, I, I mean, everything is the two of us together. And ultimately, I think my choice, like I think if it was up to Maria, I probably would have went, you know, five or six months sooner than I did. But that was the biggest piece when I like think about what, you know, we're, we're sharing and why, how having a baby, you know, made us stronger was, I mean, I think for me, the motivation changed, right? Like, I'm like, oh my gosh, like, what, what am I, what am I doing? here like what what am I doing to my family like I'm leaving my partner at home alone with our kid and like shutting off my phone like that's not me that's not who I am um, as a person and I'm like operating outside of my values and like what I think is good I went to like a seven week program was just like I think still like yeah hardest biggest decision I've ever made in my life for sure mm-hmm. and it was like really really hard to do I was a basket case like that those days leading up to that and um the first couple days while i was there the day that i dropped him off Hmm. was probably like the second hardest day of my life even though i so believed in what we were doing and it felt like we really chose this and we knew that it was the best thing for us yeah just the like sadness of like okay I have to do this thing by myself and I have to be without my person for seven weeks. Like, how are we going to do this? You come home from the seven week program and it seems like it was successful from what I read from your letter. So you want to tell me about that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, once I was there, like I was in, like I I leaned Mm -hmm. in, leaned into the work and the program and like really just embraced all of it. Yeah. Came out, came out like, you know, a different person, a a changed person with like lots of new perspective and lots of new skills skills and and ways to um you know cope and deal with life and um and yeah i guess like uh, almost a year sober nine months sober well first of all congrats thanks really a major congrats it's really awesome you know one of the themes of this particular episode of the podcast is about how having a baby changes a relationship mm. mm-hmm. it was clear from the submissions i got from people that having a baby and becoming parents can cause a lot of the worst problems to come out in a couple and what yeah. i'm hearing from you which is just so beautiful i want you two to know how how highly i think of you as a couple it sounds like you guys actually did go through some of the worst things that a couple could go through and some of the hardest times but 
the key threads that I'm hearing in your relationship is that you guys always believed in each other and you always stuck together and you made decisions together and kind of against all odds, you know, in the face of grief and in the face of years long of substance issues that were unresolved that you were able to believe in each other and still stick together even in the hardest time when it probably would have been the easiest time in your life for you two to fall apart. Oh my mm-hmm. gosh, yeah. yeah. No doubt. I don't know if we undersold it or what, but like we were fighting a lot. Like there was there was some times where like like there it was felt it like was a just a roller deal. coaster ride. Like either we were yelling and screaming and throwing things at each other or like we were good. Like it just like wasn't. It's a like healthy, highs, high high highs and low lows. It certainly wasn't a healthy uh, relationship pattern there for a little while. Yeah. Um, but I think you're right. We I don't think we ever we ever like quit on each other. Obviously, we didn't quit. We're here. We're doing it, and we always did believe in each other. Uh, and typically, a lot of that fighting was about my like my substance use. And so like there were times where it probably for me anyways and maybe we've never said this to each other but like it would have felt easier just just to like cut and run you know yeah i think having a kid forces you to decide like what kind of person you want to be in a way they like break you down because it's a newborn life and they you like they like suck everything out of you we obviously can see why people struggle but leo really just was like the thing that held us together he was just so friggin precious (laughs) and we were so in love with him and it was very easy to just focus on him like we had a vision for the life that we wanted with our son and we just didn't give up on that until we got to where we are now I think that's the defining difference is having your son be the thing that brings you together because in a lot of the stories and submissions I read, it was the child that drove the wedge. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the substance abuse issues that were going on in your life, it wasn't really a reaction to the fact that you were having a baby or that you had a baby. There were a lot of other stacking things in your life that it was like, that was going to happen to you. And the fact that you had a baby is actually what got you back on the course. Yeah, definitely. For sure. Like, I think, I, yeah, yeah. I think that's that's a, a really, really the way it is. I, I, I think, like, leading into it was, yeah, it was contributing to stress, like, overall. But, yeah, you're right. Then I once think, we like, met him, once we, we met him like... and we had him and he and he was in our life like that, that was, like, the one of the biggest, if not the biggest thing that was, like, you know, shit. Like, I, this isn't who I want to be. And that's why I wanted to bring you guys on the show because I think I have a lot of people in my audience who are getting ready to have a baby or maybe are going to have a baby in the future. And I think your story is kind of an extreme example of going into the experience of parenthood in like the worst, most stressful way possible. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But coming out on the other side positively and stronger. And like naming that we have a lot of protective factors and privilege in that like, you know, we have benefits for therapy and like really close community of friends that take care of us and and like intervene and I was never alone and but yeah ultimately you have to choose each other like look you can mend broken parts of yourself and and be better people like together and separately yeah and I mean I'm sure Zach you of everyone here seem to have had the biggest transformation as a person Mm -hmm. and it's like thank god for Leo look what he did honestly he doesn't even know right like I He doesn't even know. Yeah. I've told him that like lots of times as he's like, especially when he was smaller. Now he's just like, you can't talk to him for more than 30 seconds or he's running around the room trying to break everything. But, um, you know, when he was little and he would come visit and just like, I've, I've told him that quietly. Like he, he doesn't know how much of a difference he made and, Mm -hmm. um, just like how much power he had in our lives. That all sort of happened before he was old enough to know what was happening yeah. and i it sounds like you're going to keep him in the loop with how yeah. you know yeah, yeah. amazing he was and what an asset he was in the scenario but it sounds yeah. like luckily as he's growing he's going to get the best version of you mhm yep i saw a tear escaping from Zach's eye yeah well that happens is- these days he friends like he's not but he's a teddy bear for oh, sure yeah. what was making you emotional yeah remembering some of 
even like before I, before I went and got help when I kind of knew, like, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't doing well and I, I would, you know, I would hold them and talk to them and, you know, do things that, that, you know, dads do with little kids and, and just like the difference, like post making that choice and talking to him and, and just like t- telling him, even though he doesn't understand like how, how important he is and just like how powerful he has been in, in our lives and my life. And yeah, that was, I think that was it, but just thinking about like whispering in his ear and telling him, telling him things and, and uh, yeah. Well, you guys are really a beautiful couple. I'm so happy for you. you. I'm happy for your family. Yeah. And you guys are clearly a model of a very strong foundation for this little boy. Mm -hmm. I hope so. We hope so. Yeah. That's the goal. I just love talking to those two. Maria mentioned to me at the end of the call that she and Zach were going to be starting to try for a second baby soon. So I'm wishing them luck, sending them all the baby dust. And their story just has such a happy ending. Our third guest, you are in for a treat because typically on these audience episodes, we're not going to hear from public personalities in any way or influencers. These audience episodes really are about all of you calling in. But this person happened to write in to want to share her story and She is a public content creator. So if you do want to follow her, I will drop her handle down in the show notes. She has over 40,000 Instagram followers. And the situation you're going to hear is exceptionally difficult because the situation itself is difficult, but it was made even more layered and nuanced by the fact that Isabella is a content creator who has a very public presence. And yet during this time, she was being very quiet. In fact, this podcast is her first time opening up publicly about what happened with her marriage. So I'm so grateful to her for giving us the platform to be the first people to hear this. As I mentioned, I tightened up a lot of these interviews and removed a lot of the setup. But one thing you kind of need to know going into this call, otherwise some things might not make sense, is that Isabella and her ex-husband got married and were previously living in the United States. Her husband is from the U.S. and she's from Panama. And when they were living in the U.S., their relationship was a lot easier and her husband was a lot happier at the time. But when they moved to Panama, this is where Isabella wanted to be and where she wanted to raise kids and have a family. That's when things got complicated for them. They had decided to have a kid after two years of marriage and they came back to Panama, which was great for Isabella, but her ex-husband was not happy there at all. He didn't like his job. He didn't want to be in Panama. He wasn't even ready to have kids. And you're going to hear her share this story of how she sort of pushed him and convinced him that it was the right time for them. And that is where their story begins. I also want to give you a heads up going into this interview that this was one of those interviews I recorded very early on in the podcast production process. And my microphone was actually not recording my audio. So what you're going to hear in this interview is actually just the room audio. I think it was just my laptop or my webcam recording the audio. So I apologize for that in advance. I hope you can listen past that. And now let's get into Isabella. I think we always kind of said that we wanted to have kids after two years. I don't know why we set up that like timeline, but I was super ready. I really wanted to be a young mom. My mom had me at 22. So in my mind, I had this idea of continuing on that like tradition. The thing is that it takes two to tango and I was ready and he wasn't. And I sort of convinced him into it once that timeline hit and then I get pregnant right away cherry on top for us was that two months after we find out that we're pregnant, COVID hits. And here in Panama, the country shut down to the point that we weren't able to leave our apartments for months. Work stopped. They weren't paying employees and they were allowed not to pay employees. Um, We had to move in with my parents. It was a lot to take in. He couldn't see his parents for maybe like a year and a half. You know, you guys enter into this pregnancy in a way where one of you is not really ready, but kind of concedes. I'm curious what the actual pregnancy period was like for your relationship in terms of you guys connecting about the fact that you have this baby on the way. And was there any sign of him not only accepting it, but welcoming it and getting excited? And had you guys started planning for being parents? What did that look like? I think that's one of the biggest shockers for me because when he found out that he was 
actually becoming a father and, you know, the process of my belly growing, the baby kicking, he just seems really excited and happy. And I'm like, okay, awesome. He's on board. But he started getting really like depressed work-wise. That was a very big problem for him the whole time. It was a weird thing that the government here allowed like companies to do where they wouldn't pay the employees, but they still had to work to keep their spot. I guess people out of fear kept working. So he is definitely going through some emotions around work, but you're saying that during this time he did seem excited about the pregnancy and he wanted to come to the appointments with you. And again, we were all going through different emotions. I couldn't work personally because my work is in social media. And as you well know, at least in Panama, no one won- no one had money to pay for advertising or marketing. What about those conversations that you two had about what it would look like to be parents together? We were super excited to be parents. As I said, we had been together for such a long period of time that we envisioned this life together. I think where we didn't agree was where we wanted to do this. And that's that's what the real problem was. He was very excited about having a kid. I just don't know if he envisioned his life as a father, how that would impact his life. So Luca comes out, you have this beautiful baby boy. How are you feeling in your postpartum period? And how is he initially reacting as a father? Perfect. He, he was actually very helpful. Were you two having any sort of deep connection moments during this time of, you know, looking at each other and looking at Luca and saying, look what we made, you know, any sort of lovey-dovey moments happening? At the beginning, it started dying down. Maybe when he was like four or five months old. After New Year's, we were at the beach. And so Luca was like four months old. Yeah, four months. He exploded and just told me, I'm not happy, started crying and bawling. He's like, I need to leave this country. I'm like, what? (laughs) What do you mean? What do you mean? No, we we just got here. We just had a baby. I'm not going anywhere. That was the beginning of the end. He kept it for so long and he made sure that I didn't find out what what his feelings were for so long that once he said it, there was no going back. The relationship just kept declining. We were never the same. I was just angry all the time, very emotional. I didn't know how to face my parents or my friends or their reality, to be honest. I didn't know what to do. So I kept it to myself from January to June. I didn't tell anyone because the moment that I said it, for me, it would be a reality. And I was really scared. You said it was the beginning of the end. What were some other kind of milestone moments that led to it all imploding? He started hiding stuff because obviously, looking back, I understand. I don't, like, there's no excuse for lying. But I sort of understand where he was coming from in the sense that every time he tried to talk to me and say something that he he knew that would hurt me, I would explode. He quit his job without telling me found a new job in the U.S. without telling me, sold his car. He had a company here that he closed. So a lot of things were going on behind my back. It did get to a point where the fights were just every single day, every single day. We started couples therapy at that point. I was scared. I was scared of being a single mother under 30 with an eight-month-old baby. I was scared of being alone. I had I had been with him for 10 years. I didn't know what living alone was. There was something inside of me that told myself to give it one more shot. What were the therapy sessions like or how did those end? It was pointless. The first, and I think this is very, very important. The first um, session with a the therapist, she said something that I will never forget. And she said that a marriage is also like... A partnership it's a business at the end of the day and we were not close to being teammates 
and that she didn't see a way that we could turn it around. I've never heard a therapist coming in hot with that take and sort of like putting a or session decision on it. Because, I mean, it was it was clear. I was like, I'm not moving. And he's like, I'm not going back. So our last trip together, we went to New York for my grandmother's 70th birthday. Which is actually when you and I met. Yes. Milo was two days old, three days old, and <laughs> you come to town, you land in New York City, and we go get coffee. And this is the first time we met in person, although we've been friends online for years and we're having our coffee and you're telling me at this meeting that you're in the midst of a divorce here and by the way like you were, you were one of the only people who knew yeah it was a it was an emotional meeting we had yeah that trip was crazy for me because i i barely saw him he started giving us excuses that he needed to go to the new york office where he actually worked in miami and he would find every single second he could to be away from the family. Poor thing, he didn't want to be there. He just didn't know how to say, I don't want to be here. The day we come back to Panama, he, the, the following day, we had our session with our therapist, which was rare for him to be in person with me because he was usually in Miami. The second we start the session, he starts bawling and crying. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? I want to get a divorce. I'm like, what? What? What do you mean? I can't do this anymore. And I'm leaving tomorrow. What? It's, it's, that day is a blur. Like everything that happened after that was a blur. It's a blur for me. No one knew, again, what was going on. So my dad was coming to drop off something at my house and starts knocking on the door. I was screaming, yelling, crying. I was a mess. And I answered my, I answered my the, the door and my dad just stands there looking at me like, what the hell is happening? And I just sobbed and said, he's leaving for good. He starts coming up the stairs. I'm like, stop it. Not the moment. Tell him to leave. And then he comes back because I call him like, come back, comes back. I give him Luca. I'm like, my son doesn't have to see any of this. So pack a little bag. I gave him my son and he takes Luca for the day. I pack a little bag and I leave. I, I couldn't be here. I couldn't be around him. I, I, needed, I needed to be away. So I go to my parents' house and I stay, I stay there for a night. And I told my ex that I would come back when he had left. So I didn't want to see him leave. That, w that was too hard for me. How do you think the fate of this relationship would have been different had everything remained the same except for having had a baby? Going back to every single detail and every single red flag that I saw and that he saw in me too. Because again, this takes two to tango. I don't think we were meant to be together, honestly. Really big differences that we couldn't deal with. I wanted a very familiar life. I wanted a very family-oriented life. I wanted to be near everyone that I loved. And he wanted to party, and he wanted to be a bachelor, and he wanted to feel free. And having kids kind of takes away that freedom. I think that was one of the things that made me more angry because while I'm at home with a newborn doing nothing else than attending a newborn, he's out partying. He's out partying with random people that I didn't know. And as I mentioned, I do have social media presence. So I start getting videos and photos of him with random girls in clubs in Miami. Was there any sort of conversation between the two of you about his unreadiness to be the type of person who's sitting at home with a baby did he was he starting to tell you you know i'm not done partying i'm not done with this phase of my life he did say it at some point i don't remember specifically but he might have said it like this is not the lifestyle that i want i'm not ready for this i think he felt trapped he did mention several times that he was used to being 
he, he was used to living a more independent life. You know, it's funny because once I started seeing those photos, that's the anger turned into I'm done. I'm done crying. I'm done. I'm done feeling miserable. I'm done feeling sorry for myself. I am done being a victim. I'm much more than that. I'm 28 years old. I look good. I have a job. I can do this. I don't need him. I don't need a man. I don't need him. I don't need anyone. That lit a fire inside of me that led me to just come back to who I am. I was grieving this for a year and a half. So once the moment came, the worst had already happened. And I was tired, tired of people feeling sorry for me. And wherever I went, they were like, oh, poor Isabella. I'm like, no, stop, stop. I'm done. Because for a long time, I thought that he was also feeling horrible, missing his son, missing his wife. No, he was living happily. And I wanted that too. I come from my parents' marriage who they've been together for 30 plus years. And I never thought that this would happen to me. It was just unreal. And I couldn't forgive that until (laughs) four months passed. And I was set up with my now husband. (laughs) And that was that. Did you feel like that four month time period was enough of the time that you felt like you needed to sort of equal parts grieve and have fun as yourself again? It sounds like nothing. And it it is nothing. (laughs) But it was just a perfect time. Perfect. I don't know how. As I said, I, I, I grieved this relationship for a long period of time before anyone knew. So I kind of made peace with that. It's crazy how people started telling me, like, you look different before meeting Michael. You look different. You look happy. You're, like, glowing. I hadn't been myself, and I hadn't felt that happy in so long that I was really ready for whatever came next. The thing is that, obviously, I never in a million years thought that the first guy who I was going to talk to after getting divorced would be my husband now. You're in this unique position as a public personality, and especially with your cultural background, and I'm sure a lot of people from Panama follow you. I also find it incredibly interesting that you are a public personality, yet here you are, face and name, publicly sharing the story, when you maybe could have come on behind a fake name and I could have blurred your video. Why are you so comfortable, or not why, how are you so comfortable talking about your story now and How did it feel in the moment to come on social media after you have this huge wedding and there's a ton of Instagram content about your marriage and your life and your new baby? How did that feel to come out with the news? I hid it for so long. I never denied it. I hid it. That it made me, I've always been very real on my social media and it made me feel very fake. And I didn't like that. So I guess after a lot of therapy, I came to the point where I told myself that at some point I would tell my story. I think this is the perfect opportunity. When people found out, people started texting me privately because it's crazy the amount of people who have unhappy marriages. Because going through a divorce can be the loneliest process of your life. And it's also very like shameful um, because you're failing at something that everyone thought was beautiful and perfect and I thought of myself as a failure. And so I told myself that anyone who came to me and asked me, I would be real, raw, and honest. I've never been so happy in my life. And I do believe in second chances or third chances or whatever someone needs. You don't need to have that one love in your life. It doesn't have to be that way. It's not cookie cutter. It doesn't have to be. For the first time in September, when it was Lucas's third birthday, we spent his birthday here at home my ex-husband and my husband together as a family singing in front of everyone, like singing happy birthday. And I posted pictures of us three together, well, us four together. And the amount of messages that I got because of that, crazy. People impressed of our maturity for being able to spend, you know, time together. And at the end of the day, you do it because of the kid, no? But it also... In my case, it also came to a point where where my ex and I are friends. We get along great. And he gets along great with my husband. 
and it's just a very respectful relationship. If you're going through a struggle in your marriage and you're staying there because of your kids, listen, don't. You know, I can't speak for children of divorced parents. I too come from parents that are ha happily married after 35 years. But what I do feel like I can say with certainty is that from a child's perspective, what's so much more valuable than having two parents that are married is having two parents that are both in good emotional states. If you're clearly in the wrong marriage, you're not in the right state. So I think any child at the end of the day, even though every child probably wants their parents to stay together, even if just for logistics and for seeing your both parents all the time, obviously any child might want that, but what's gonna help them turn into the best adult with the healthiest relationships is seeing two parents who are taking good care of themselves and being happy, even if that means they're in relationships with other people. Yeah, because I mean, it is complicated, but at the same time, I was lucky. I met my now husband when my son was a year old. So my son has a father figure. And funny enough, he calls my husband dad. Because that's all he knows. Does your ex know that? And how does he feel yeah. about that? It was, it was difficult. <laughs> he found out because he was here visiting. And Luca was like, no, I want to go back home with dad. He's like, no, I'm dad. He's like, no, 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 dad. <laughs> so Luca is lucky enough that he has two, two fathers. And that's that. Isabella, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for opening up about this story. I'm excited for you to share with the people who have been following you for years. And this is going to impact so many people. I'm confident you're going to hear from people and get DMs after this episode goes live. So I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing your story. I'm so happy that you're so happy now. Oh, I love you. Thank you. Thank you really for, for letting me do this and opening up. It's important. Everything happens for a reason. As cliche as it is, it's true. I really hope you liked listening to these guests and hearing these stories. And you know, as I'm listening back to these three stories, I realized that even though there are elements of positivity sprinkled throughout, these three stories are actually three really hard situations. And I want to make sure, I said this up front, this isn't supposed to be any sort of accurate depiction of what having a baby will do to your relationship. I just want to make sure, because I know a lot of my audience members are pregnant, you know, with their first, they're about to become new parents, or maybe they're not even married yet and they're on the younger side, but they're thinking they want to have kids in the future. The last thing I want this episode to be is something that scares people out of wanting to have kids because, oh, look, these three stories are three really scary stories of things that could happen to me and I don't want that to happen, so I'm out. I really want you to take a step back and look at the podcast for what it is which is just three people's real life stories. I'm sure if you put the call out there for people who had incredibly positive, all around positive, like no negative moments whatsoever, I'm sure if you put the call out for that, you would find tons of people that could come on and talk about that. And I'm not saying I didn't wanna talk about those magical perfect moments on this show, because those are real moments too. It's more so that I actually think some of the harder stories are more helpful for people. If you are having a magical moment, that's great. But if you're having a hard moment, it's hearing other people who are going through hard times too that will help you get through. Remember, if you wanna come on the show and you wanna talk about a topic that is near and dear to your heart, visit lucyfink.com slash apply and tell us why you'd be a good guest. You can always choose to be anonymous. We can blur your face, change your name, or you can come on and share your real self. If you're liking the show so far and you open the Apple Podcast app, tapping on write a review and then leaving a five-star rating and a written review is one of the best ways that you can help the show get seen by more people, get heard by more people, and help more people. So if you truly like it, like don't just do this because I'm telling you to, but if you really are enjoying it and it's resonating with you in some way, please write one of those reviews and take a screenshot of it. Send it over to me on Instagram over DM and I will reply with a special thank you with a personalized voice note. I am having so much fun recording these episodes for you. I honestly can't express how joyous this podcast is making me and I have a ton of amazing interviews lined up for you. So thank you so much for listening and we will see you again next week on The Real Stuff. 
Thank you so much for tuning in to The Real Stuff. I'm Lucy Fink. Don't forget to follow the show on social media at The Real Stuff Pod. And if you're liking these episodes, please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a written review. It helps the show so much. And if you're feeling called to come on the show, visit lucyfink.com slash apply and tell us your story. We'll see you next week for another intimate conversation on The Real Stuff.